You're listening to Conferences Online Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospital in Kansas City, Missouri. Today is August 10, 2020, and I'm your host, Dr. Jay Portnoy. Our topic today, Severe Combined Immune Deficiency. Our presenter is Dr. Ian Grunbaum. He's a professor of immunology and pediatrics at the University of Toronto Hospital for Sick Children in Toronto, Canada. So again, uh, uh, thank you for the kind invitation to talk to you today about severe combined immune deficiency, or SCID for short. Um, My objectives are uh, to describe some of the classical clinical and laboratory features of severe combined immune deficiency, help you then recognize the changes that newborn screening for SCID has had uh, on our practice, and discuss some of the advances and future directions in the management of SCID. Um, I will emphasize that I have no conflict of interest to declare. And with this, I'll uh, actually move to the first patient. Uh, This patient uh, was referred to us in 2007 when he was four months old. And uh, he was sent to us because of recurrent ear infections. And he had one evident evident, uh, pneumonia. He also was failing to thrive. Um, The family history was uh, uh, important because he had a maternal uncle who died in infancy. Um, On physical exam, he was cachectic and dyspneic. He did have some oral thrush. And uh, importantly, we could not palpate any uh, uh, lymph nodes. Um, Other examination, uh, uh, the rest of the examination was normal. Uh, they did show bilateral uh, B. basilar infiltrates, um, and uh, um, um, there was, uh, in contrast to uh, a thymus that you can see here, our patient actually did not have a thymus. This was further confirmed by ultrasound of the chest, which is really the, the best uh, and most sensitive imaging modality to look for a thymus. In addition, X-ray did not, uh, chest X-ray showed ground glass opacities and septal thickening. Laboratory evaluation, including neutrophil numbers and platelets, were normal, excluding the possibility of uh, Westcott-Alger syndrome. He did have marked lymphopenia. His IgG uh, was low but present. Although I must say that at this age, it might still have reflected maternal IgG that passed the placenta. Another important clue, however, was the IgA and IgM, which I would have expected to be increased given the history of the ear and lung infections. Importantly for the diagnosis and management uh, were the identification of CMV cytomegalovirus in his blood and PJP, pneumocystis uh, geovesi uh, pneumonia, found in a bonfort in a bronchovelar lavage done because of his respiratory status. And for me, a combination of CMV and PJP uh, are, pat- are practically pathognomonic for severe T-cell dysfunction, although at this point we would still need to determine whether, whether this was a primary or secondary uh, phenomena. And so really before proceeding to Uh, the diagnosis of severe combined immune deficiency, it's really important to exclude secondary immune deficiencies, including infections, medications, and even severe sepsis or malignancy that can cause a secondary abnormality. But in in our patient, uh, we excluded this and moved on to uh, analyze uh, his uh, lymphocyte subsets by using flow cytometry. This demonstrated that our patient had practically no T cells or natural killer cells, while his B cell numbers were normal. He also had no naive T cells. Finally, the few T cells that were present did not uh, respond to stimulation by PHA or anti-CD3, which are the typical um, uh, mitogens uh, that we use to uh, uh, stimulate T cells in our lab. 
All of this led to the diagnosis that he had a T minus absent T cells, B plus, that means present B cells, and K minus severe combined immune deficiency. And uh, the plus and minus that I just mentioned is an important nomenclature um, because it provides us usually with a at least a preliminary clue to the actual diagnosis. For example, absence of T cells with normal B cells and natural killer cells, which we would designate as T minus, B plus, and K plus, is common among patients with defects in the, in the CD3 uh, chain, in the IL-2, uh, IL-7 receptor alpha deficiency, and a few more other conditions. T minus, B plus, and K minus, which is really what our patient uh, uh, phenotype immunophenotyping was, uh, is common in patients with IL-2 receptor gamma deficiency or JAK3 uh, defects. Uh, after saying this, I do want to uh, caution you because we have seen increasing number of discordancy between the phenotype and genotype. Um, and there is more uh, uh, defects that are rapidly being identified. If you do want to uh, take another look at this uh, 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 long list of uh, conditions, um, I put in the reference for a, a really good uh, update uh, of the uh, inborn era of immunities published by the International Union of Immunological Societies. Um, this is another great uh, uh, reference that I often recommend to uh, uh, residents and fellows. Um, which uh, looks at the phenotypic classification. And you can actually see on the left side of this figure how a severe combined immune deficiency with no T cells and no NK cells uh, and B cells present is really caused by either IL-2 receptor gamma deficiency or JAK3 uh, defects. So only a very short list of uh, differential diagnosis. Um, the, uh, the gamma in our patient, uh, the defect was actually in the gamma chain of the IL-2 receptor, which is also known as the gamma common chain, gamma C. This name's co the, the name comes from the fact that the same chain is required for sing signaling through several cytokine receptors, including the IL-2 and IL-4 that are important for T cell defects, and IL-15 that is important for natural killer cell development. You can also see in this cartoon um, that all these cytokine receptors signal through the JAK3 uh, molecule, which is why defects in gamma C and JAK3 lead to practically identical phenotype. The gamma common chain is on the X chromosome, which is why males are affected by females are carriers, as was the case in our patient. Uh, X-link SCID, which is also known as X-link, as SCID X1, is the most common cause of severe combined immune deficiency in North America, as demonstrated in this pie graph from Jennifer Puck's paper in 2017. I do all, uh, want to mention that in some U.S. states and in countries where consanguinity or founder effects are more frequent, uh, autosomal recessive conditions such as defects in RAG1 or RAG2 uh, are much more prevalent forms of severe combined immune deficiency. So after making the diagnosis of severe combined immune deficiency, it is really uh, uh, critical to understand that this is a medical emergency. This is possibly one of the few uh, conditions uh, where I actually encourage our trainees to call me in the middle of the night. This is a, uh, often patients who can deteriorate quickly and need really uh, advanced management. Uh, it is critical to start supportive treatment as quickly as possible. Um, babies can crash any minute. We need to look for and treat their infections. Um, we need to uh, uh, provide them with antibiotic prophylaxis and immunoglobulin prophylaxis. Some places also add fungal and CMV uh, preventive measurements. If they do need blood products, they should be 
CMV negative and irradiated. And if, they, if the uh, family, if the mother uh, prefers to breastfeed, then we need to look for their uh, CMV status. Um, patients also need uh, a lot of energy. So many of our patients have uh, required NG tubes or TPN. But it's important to remember that all these are temporary measures. What the patients really need is a new immune system. And so in parallel to stabilizing the patient, it's really important to uh, initiate HLA typing for the, fam for the patient and the family um, as allogeneic hematopoietic stem cell transplant is really the only curative treatment that is available in our days. And it's important to do this as quickly as possible because sometimes an emergency transplant can save patients. We've had uh, patients were uh, within a week or 10 days, we actually moved to transplants because the patients were, quote, were so sick. In parallel, it's also important to establish the etiology of the severe combined immune deficiency because there are rare conditions where transplant is not uh, beneficial or, or even contradic uh, uh, contradicted. For example, in patients with ataxitil and ectasia, we probably would not go proceed with transplant. Another very important uh, 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 cause for severe combined immune deficiency that is now being uh, uh, more, uh, that is being recognized more frequently are uh, defects caused by uh, problems in the stoma cells. And uh, these patients should receive a different, uh, a trans, uh, different management. And for those who are interested, I, uh, I'll be happy to expand about stoma defects later on uh, at the question period. Coming back to our patient, uh, he was fortunate to have a nationally matched sibling donor. So after co controlling his infections, we proceeded to transplant using some chemotherapy conditioning. He did well, and now, 13 years later, he has a normal immune system. Attended, he attends high school and is doing extremely well. And he's not alone. In uh, North America today, uh, such outcomes are actually expected. And in the next few slides, I want to describe the North American situation. In a landmark paper, the uh, North American Primary Immune Deficiency Treatment Consortium, or PIDTC for short, described the outcome of patients with severe combined immune deficiency who were transplanted um, between uh, 2000 and 2009. The study included 240 patients from 25 centers uh, across uh, Canada and the U.S. who were transplanted over this period. The reason to focus on, on this period was because at this time, transplant procedures have become relatively standard, including HLA typing and availability of antimicrobial agents. Uh, importantly, three quarters of the patients had had some infections before transplant, and in 60% of the patients, these infections were still active at the time of transplant. The majority of patients had received mismatch-related donors, primarily from parents that were haploidentical. Overall, the survival was really good, with a close to 75% survival, um, where the best outcome was obviously with those who received HLA-matched sibling donors, but also patients who received mismatch-related donors from their, from their haploidentical parents uh, did quite well. In contrast, patients who received Un, uh, umbilical cord blood or patients uh, who received uh, mismatch related donors but received significant conditioning did uh, quite poorly, possibly because they had uh, underlying infections and it took a long time for their immune system to recover and control these infections. Further evidence for this uh, hypothesis that infections were the cause of the complications um, uh, indicated when they subdivided the patients 
into uh, potential risk factors. And they found that uh, some of the most uh, important risk factors were uh, the time of transplant, that is transplant uh, beyond three and a half months of life, and patients who had active infection. And indeed, if patient had both of these risk factors, uh, their chances of surviving the t uh, long term was less than 50%. Um, subsequent uh, uh, papers actually allowed us to, uh, uh, from the same group, using even larger number of patients, allowed us to even analyze the outcome uh, in patients with uh, IL-2 receptor gamma and JAK3 defects. And uh, importantly, these patients had the best outcome. Actually, 90% of these patients, such as our patient, uh, had uh, demonstrated long-term survival. So uh, definitely what uh, we saw in our patient is what I would have expected and what is now known uh, in uh, North America. So the conclusion from the first part of my talk is that the outcome of severe combined immune deficiency depends on early diagnosis and early transplantation before these patients develop infections. And so really the, the next question and what will be the topic of my, my second part uh, is how can we achieve early diagnosis for severe combined immune deficiency. And this brings me to the second patient. Uh, this, uh, this patient uh, was referred to, uh, to me in 2018, and in this patient, we already established a diagnosis that he was, uh, uh, that he had no T cells, no NK cells, but did have B cells. And although he didn't have any prior family history or clinical clues, he was flagged at one week of age because of, of newborn screening program for severe combined immune deficiency. And so when I saw him when he was about a week old, he was still free of infections. And so I do want to spend the next couple of minutes by talking um, about uh, the newborn screening for severe combined immune deficiency. The program, which started in the U.S. and now covers all newborns, uh, uh, born in the U.S. Uh, was also implemented in Canada, uh, at least in some of the provinces, in 2013. And it relies on a, a very smart concept uh, called T-cell receptor excision circle, or TREX for short. So what are TREX? The TREX is based on the fact that the T-cell receptor rearrangement requires excision of a piece of DNA to allow approximation of the VDJ gene segments. This is a, a basic concept in immunology that some of you may remember from your immunology uh, uh, undergrad courses. Um, the, uh, and it's important because the excised pieces of DNA remain in thymocytes as these cells uh, mature and leave the thymus. So um, Daniel Dueck, while studying uh, patients with HIV and studying their immune reconstitution after uh, uh, treatment, uh, developed uh, a TREC assay that allows measurement of these TRECs in the peripheral blood. Uh, Jennifer Park, who was at the NIH also at the same time, saw that maybe it could be used also to identify pay, uh, uh, patients with severe combined immune deficiency because if this is in their blood and she could actually extract DNA from dry, dry blood spots uh, on from gut card from these uh, cardboard papers that are taken from every newborn, maybe she could use this as a surrogate marker for the number of patients, for the number of T cells produced by the, by the thymus. And so, uh, indeed, further work showed that the absence of TREC is practically pathognomonic for severe combined immune deficiency. Uh, I do want to uh, caution you that uh, while uh, absent TREC is uh, almost the equivalent of severe combined immune deficiency, 
when we look at low tech numbers, um, it's a little bit more complicated because the cutoff values differ from one place to another, uh, which affects the uh, uh, essay's sensitivity and specificity. And so uh, most places do have some false positive. Uh, that is, patients who are called back because of a normal T-cell receptor excision circle essay, but actually will not uh, eventually have severe combined immune deficiency. And so what we now do is patients who do come up with abnormal threat levels, we bring them back and we analyze their T-cell subsets, including naive T-cells. And uh, we've learned to recognize that there are patients with what I would call, and you can't see it, but what I would call a false, false positive result. That is patients who uh, we bring in and have low TREX, but eventually the TREX will recover. And this is often caused by prematurity or low birth weight, sepsis, etc. There are also some maternal conditions that can cause this false uh, positive result. Um, and uh, uh, it's important to appreciate that. There are also some causes for what I would call true false positive, that is persistent low T-cell receptor excision circles and T-cells, but these are not severe combined immune deficiency. And some of the examples are 22Q11 or DeGeorge syndrome, charge association, ataxia telangiectasia, um, and trisomy 21. You should also remember that there might be some false negative, that is, patients with true severe combined immune deficiency or other profound T-cell deficiency, deficiencies that may be missed. It's rare, but they do happen, and so it's important to remember them. Um, and so as a, a, a pediatricians, as immunologists, uh, it's always important to be vigilant and, and uh, uh, never rely completely on the fact that the patient was not flagged by a normal TREC essay to consider him as suffering from a severe combined immune deficiency that needs uh, uh, transplant. But it is important to appreciate that newborn screening significantly changed how we manage our patients. Um, as I mentioned, now almost 50% of the patients uh, are, uh, 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 that do present, that are identified with severe combined immune deficiency are identified by newborn screening. Uh, and in this uh, really good paper from Dr. Heimel and the PADTC, you can see that uh, how from 2010 to 2014, there was a significant increase in the number of patients identified by newborn screening. And this has led to a, a significant change in the way that we manage these patients. While in the past, many of them came in sick and had to stay in the hospital, in our days, most patients are actually clinically well, and so we don't admit them. We ask that they are isolated at home by the family, assuming that it's a reliable family and the, the distance allows them to come for uh, frequent follow-ups. We give them antibiotic prophylaxis, and uh, um, we try and get them to transplant as early as possible. I do want to mention that the it has actually raised some challenges. Uh, you're fa uh, uh, speaking with a family who has a completely healthy looking child who has not had any infection and all that you're trying to convince the family is to take him to transplant just because of lab results has become uh, or is not, an, is not an easy task, but it definitely has resulted in a, a significant improvement to the patient overall survival. And you can see, again, from Dr. Heimel's paper, um, how well patients are now doing with uh, overall survival um, in patients with severe combined immune deficiency, somewhere around 90% uh, uh, if they don't, they come in without infections. 
the improvement in survival um, is uh, uh, mostly attributed to the marked increase in survival of the mismatch-related uh, donors, uh, followed by the unrelated donors. But altogether, you can see that uh, in uh, comparison to the previous uh, um, uh, outcomes that I showed you in uh, 20 in the uh, in the initial decade, uh, how the the survival has improved. So going back to our patient, after establishing the, the diagnosis of IL-2 receptor gamma defect as the cause for his severe combined immune deficiency, um, we proceeded to an HLA unrelated transplant, which as I showed you, uh, uh, has greater than 90, 95% survival. There were some important questions that we asked ourselves and discuss with the family, how to best prepare the patient for TAPA, that is how much conditioning or chemotherapy to give him, how to best prevent graft versus host disease, and whether we should consider allogeneic hematopoietic stem cell TAPA or think about gene therapy, autologous gene therapy. And actually in the next couple of slides, we'll expand on this because I think these are the questions that we now face more and more frequently, um, um, and, and I think this is, uh, these are topics that in the next couple of years will uh, uh, be on top of our uh, 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 interest. But uh, going back to our patient, after several discussions, the family decided to proceed with an unrelated transplant with reduced intensity conditioning and uh, with some very mild graft versus host disease prophylaxis with a combination of methotrexate and a calcineurin inhibitor tacolomys. And I can update you that two years uh, later, uh, as I still follow him, he's doing extremely well. He has no infections. Uh, he has uh, fully engrafted, engrafted, engrafted the donor, and he has a normal immune system. Nevertheless, as I mentioned, because these questions will continue to uh, uh, follow us, I do want to use the next couple of slides to try and address these issues. So the, the amount of uh, conditioning has uh, been a contentious uh, issue for many, many years. Clearly, uh, uh, we now know that uh, the amount of conditioning should vary in accordance to the uh, specific genetic defect. And uh, for example, in patients with IL-2 receptor gamma defects, we know that if we do not use any conditioning, about 50% of the patients will require an immunoglobulin replacement for life. In contrast, if, they give, if we give them full myeloablative conditioning, then they will not need the immunoglobulins, but they may face more early and late complications. So trying to find the sweet spot between these uh, two opposing approaches um, has become an important topic in our, for our uh, patients and among uh, an important topic for the transplanters. Um, and so uh, we the PIDTC, the primary immune deficiency treatment consortium, uh, just recently uh, initiated a prospective uh, study where patients are being randomized to very low versus low dose conditioning in uh, transplant for I2 receptor gamma and uh, uh, versus uh, patients who uh, suffer from RAG1 and RAG2 deficiencies. And so I do think that in the next couple of years, we will have an answer for this. Another important uh, uh, question that we're facing is how to best prevent and treat uh, graft-versus-host disease. And uh, the emphasis in recent years have been on the prevention of graft of this uh, uh, condition, mostly because uh, uh, after treating infections, this is really the most common cause of morbidity and mortality in patients with uh, uh, benign, uh, 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 who receive transplants for benign uh, conditions. 
And so two, two strategies that are becoming uh, uh, quite popular, the first is the depletion of uh, T cells, T cells that, uh, the alpha beta T cells and B cells while keeping the gamma delta T cells. And uh, this approach, which uh, uh, has uh, been quite popular uh, in, uh, uh, in Europe, uh, there are already some preliminary papers showing that indeed there is a significant reduction in graft versus host disease in these patients with, with very low uh, graft failure, although patients still have quite a lot of infections after transplant. So I think uh, there's still some more room for improvement in these, uh, for these patients. Another very exciting uh, strategy is uh, low-dose cyclophosphamide, cyclophosphamide, which has been used in, in hormatological conditions and has been used in much higher conditions in patients with malignancy, uh, targets uh, cycling T cells. And if it's given three to four days after transplantation, uh, it can eliminate the donor T cells that are now proliferating after they were stimulated by the recipient's uh, tissues. And so this uh, targets specifically the donor T cells and the proliferating T cells. And it actually spares all the remaining non-proliferating T cells and the bone marrow cells. It's also a very relatively easy uh, 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 compound. Uh, many places have a lot of experience cyclophosphamide. So this, has, uh, I think, has become one of the uh, go-to treatments for prevention of graft versus host disease in uh, many centers, both in uh, North America uh, and in places where uh, T cell depletion is not as readily available. The third option that uh, um, we're now debating for patients with clean skin is gene therapy. Um, obviously, since the identification of the gamma C chain as the cause for clean skin in the 1990s, people have been uh, interested in developing gene therapy for this condition. There are many advantages for gene therapy including the avoidance of graft versus host disease and graft rejection. Uh, and this allows the use of less or actually no conditioning. Um, since the early 2000s, several groups have tried to use the gamma retroviruses to deliver a normal uh, uh, copy of the gamma C chain into the patient's bone marrow cells. And there, were, uh, there was a landmark uh, uh, study in uh, France and England where they treated 20 patients with uh, such uh, a gene therapy for SCID-X1. Unfortunately, 25% uh, of the patients developed some hematological malignancies, which was uh, due to the disruption of oncogene regulation. Uh, and this was the cause because insertional mutagenesis of the uh, virus that they used. This caused a moratorium on gene therapy for SCID-X1 for almost a decade, but then in uh, 2010, a safer gamma retrovirus was developed, which indeed avoided the leukemic complication, complications, yet uh, it did not result in complete immune reconstitution. And so this one was all eventually replaced, but what is called, what I would consider the uh, third generation of gene therapy for SCID-X1, uh, where in actually in 2015, um, they began using a safer and more effective lentivirus to develop to deliver the gamma C gene to the, into the patient's uh, uh, CD34 positive cells. In this case, they actually used a low dose busulfan and uh, successfully uh, collected all lineages in eight patients. And this is uh, this uh, slide from a recent uh, great review uh, in uh, uh, the uh, JACI, uh, which describes actually uh, the paper that was published in uh, last year in the New England Journal of Medicine. 
Importantly, there was, uh, in these patients, there was no evidence of abnormal gene integration, and there was no uh, paleochemic transformation. Patients were able to clear the infections, and half of them have already stopped immunoglobulin re replacement. So this is, I think, uh, uh, a very exciting and promising uh, development that uh, will uh, be attractive, uh, probably as this becomes more and more, as uh, more and more experience is gained with these patients. Sorry. So, uh, we're, what is the future? Uh, clearly, I, I think that gene therapy is becoming a uh, very attractive option for patients with primary immune deficiency. Uh, and, and there's increasing uh, uh, conditions uh, that we're looking for uh, uh, gene therapy to provide uh, cure. We need to make these uh, gene therapy safer and more efficient. Uh, this can be done by adding and tweaking the, the delivery system, uh, adding insulators and uh, suicide elements, so if there is some uh, leukemic transformation, then uh, we can uh, use, uh, then we can uh, uh, activate this and eliminate the, don the, the potentially leukemic cells. Uh, another very important development is the ability to gene edit uh, using uh, uh, things like zinc fingers, talons, or CRISPRs, and uh, the biggest advantage of these is that we can actually target the genes rather than the random gene addition that is currently being done. Uh, we can actually target the genes to specific sites, and uh, uh, we can uh, do this without uh, uh, disrupting other genes. Uh, we can uh, deliver just one specific allele, and so there's a lot of advantages to uh, these uh, gene therapy options. So, in conclusion, um, I hope I convinced you that newborn screening has changed the presentation and management of severe combined immune deficiencies. There are some conditions that might be missed by newborn screening, hence uh, I urge you to continue to be vigilant for this possibility. It's important to identify uh, a patient with severe combined immune deficiency and with this early identification and better transplant techniques, uh, the outcome of these patients have improved uh, significantly in the last couple of years. Um, we do have a few skin conditions uh, and other primary immune deficiency where gene therapy is becoming the preferable treatment option and that gene uh, editing holds great promise for primary immune deficiency and others. I do want to uh, finish by uh, uh, acknowledging uh, the many members of my division, the many national and international collaborators, and obviously patients and uh, uh, families because we're really here to uh, try and provide them with the best care. Uh, now, in the last couple of minutes that I have before taking your questions, I do want to talk about uh, uh, an interesting development that was just recently uh, published, and that is something that will help us uh, try and better uh, decide whether or not patients with uh, absent T cells should receive allogeneic hematopoietic stem cell transplant, as uh, we have been doing for the last uh, uh, 30 or 40 years, or should we try and proceed with thymic transplants. The issue is uh, that there are patients where the absence of T cells reflects not a problem in their hematopoietic stem cell. Until today, there weren't good ways to try and distinguish between these two conditions. Uh, I'm getting a, a note that uh, bad network quality. Are you also, uh, are you hearing me well? 
And we're hearing you fine. Continue, please. Okay. okay. So, um, so trying to distinguish between uh, these two conditions has been quite challenging, and often um, we proceeded to hematopoietic stem cell transplants without knowing what was the cause. Over the last couple of years, recognizing that we can grow T cells ex vivo if we provide them with the proper signals and recognizing that uh, uh, notch signaling uh, is important for T cell development allowed a group uh, actually from uh, Canada, which is uh, one of the reasons that I take so much pride, has allowed uh, development of an essay, uh, an ex vivo essay that would uh, examine whether or not T cells can develop ex vivo if we provide them with uh, the proper signaling. And so in this essay, we take somewhere between 5 and 10 ml of the patient's peripheral blood, uh, isolate the CD34 positive cells, uh, put them in a three-dimensional <coughs> artificial culture system, and if they grow well, then we know that the problem uh, is likely in the thymic stroma and not in the hematopoietic stem cell themselves. And so if they grow well, then these patients will likely require a thymic transplant. If they don't grow well, then it's likely because the problem in the hematopoietic stem cell. And these patients will, will actually benefit from uh, hematopoietic stem cell transplants. So this is a very, uh, 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 I think, clever uh, technique that will allow us to better distinguish between patients and really shows how we've moved from a one-size-fits-all one uh, management approach to a more personalized uh, medicine, looking at these in designing management. And so with this, I'll end my talk and I'll be happy to answer questions if there are uh, any. So thank you very much.